Hello my fellow Kerbinauts and welcome to the next episode of Realism. So obviously in the last one we set up our uh, you know our satellite network in geostationary orbit or geostationary is the word that you'd use if it was Earth and uh, yeah we set that up that's working fairly well at the moment actually um, you know we seem to be able to con get a connection to it later on in this mission which you'll see and um, so that that works perfectly fine um, and that's that's all set up now we don't have to worry too much about that but we do have a couple of problems we are going to need uh, probably two more satellites in Kerbin orbit and those are going to be our sort of long-range satellites those are what, are what we're going to use to connect to well the next place that we go which may well be Juna I uh, haven't actually done that yet I haven't decided yet so we'll see but we're going to need uh, longer range satellites and we need to get the science to get those so basically we need to go and get some more science and uh, had a look in the science facilities uh, yeah science center basically uh, and it turns out that we haven't actually got um, all the science that we could have from the moon basically so we decided to go back there so this is my mission um, doesn't go quite completely 100% to plan but it was it was good fun and uh, we got reasonably far we did reasonably well so you'll notice there we go we've got into an orbit now with this craft and this thing is way over delta V like the the lander doesn't have quite enough delta V really I think the lander could do with more but I didn't want to make it wider than the rest of the rocket and the um, uh, sorry the rest of the rocket the sort of lifter stages and transfer stages are too big so we end up landing on the moon with still some fuel left in our transfer stage because we're using that to land basically which is fine we still get enough science for what we need so I'm happy with that but there are a couple more things that we still would probably like uh, before we actually go all the way to Juno so we'll see and um, we'll have a look and uh, see where we go from what we get from this mission so you know we should be able to land at, at least one place on the moon Anyway, at this point, I'm just trying to slow us down a little bit, bring that periapsis down around the moon, because obviously we want to bring it nice and low before we circularize. And then one thing that I decided I'd do, this is mainly to test um, our satellite system, is actually to, uh, what's the best way of putting this, land on the side of the moon that's facing Kerbin, because that's the side of the moon that will be able to see the satellites. So that's what I decided to do there and yeah it actually turns out fairly well sorry though that side did happen to be the dark side while I was landing so I just decided to get on with it and uh, yeah I was kind of short for time for recording and things so I decided to get on with it and yeah we do end up landing on the darker side of the moon so sorry if you can't see too much at the moment uh, or you know in a few minutes time maybe but uh, yeah, we're just getting rid of all that horizontal velocity that we have, obviously. Um, so we're falling straight down, makes landing a lot easier. We've got plenty of fuel, you can see in this stage, there's uh, loads of fuel left. So, you know, there was no real issue with this mission fuel-wise until we get to the very, very end, uh, because the lander doesn't have as much fuel as it maybe could. And here I'm having trouble seeing, like when I was playing, I was having trouble seeing. So I went into the radar altitude display inside the cockpit and used that to land, or at least to get very close to landing. Um, and there we go, we're at 200 meters up now-ish. And uh, just try and bring it down at basically less than 10 meters a second is okay. Uh, it doesn't quite go perfectly this landing because obviously I'm trying to split off and then I realized that I throttled up a little bit just before I split off so that that thing had uh, its throttle locked on but it was okay we had enough thr thrust on this stage to you know move out the way basically you see there the other thing exploded in the background but there we go we made a successful landing and yeah so in, in case you didn't know the same side of the moon is always facing earth and it's the same with the moon in Kerb and Kerbal Space Program uh, that's because the moon, I believe, is uh, tidally locked. I think that's the correct term for why that is. Um, which basically means that it always points the same direction. I think it's something to do, in fact, with um, gravity gradients, which, uh, if you don't know, Harv, who does other KSP videos, a lot more popular than me, has a video where he explains that all, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, yeah, if you haven't, if you don't know what that is, then go and have a look. But it's basically... Um, something t it's it, uh, it's kind of hard to explain but he does it very well because you almost need to be able to draw what you're saying 
um, but it's basically where one side of something is heavier than the other so the fact that gravity is distant different at one end of it from the other means that it stays pointing in one direction basically anyway so we managed to land um, separately and do a load of reports that kind of thing um, you know it's kind of standard um, but yeah we got here with plenty of fuel left over and yeah we do some science get everything everything that we can basically get as much science as we can from this landing but I'm fairly sure that obviously because we've got a full fuel tank we'll be able to land at least once somewhere else if everything goes to plan which uh, <laughs> spoilers it maybe doesn't um, so I'm kind of repeating science here because I want to just make the most of the fact that I brought all these material bays here um, and yeah the thing that actually happened now is that I decided I wanted to head all the way over to this big big crater here the moon I think it's called the moon's east crater and this crater is quite far away from where I was but it was okay um, not not a big deal to go all the way there and it would have been absolutely fine but the landing didn't go quite to plan and I think this is something to do with the Kraken I think the Kraken was involved here because something just played up physics wise and I hadn't quick saved recently so I couldn't really load a quick save and if I'd made an honest mistake I wouldn't have let myself load a quick save but I didn't make an honest mistake the game just bugged out a little bit so I had to do my best to try and work a way around that using <laughs> yeah probably quite well yeah it was quite a few quick saves so anyway we're coming down and I open that antennae to test the thing out when we get land and then realize that it used up all our electricity and we couldn't steer and we crashed so down on the ground um, yeah we kind of had to use the edge of a crater to get ourselves back into the air because we had nowhere near enough torque in the command pod even though we used the you know uh, solar panels and charged everything up we couldn't do that so we had to use the edge of a crater to get ourselves back home and also a reasonable amount of fuel as well but we did get science from it so everything's all good and uh, yeah after that we just ended up taking off and heading back home but this is where it gets a bit interesting you'll see so I'm trying to um, accelerate get away from the moon and uh, I think oh yeah everything's gonna be fine we've got plenty of fuel all that kind of thing but then I start to realize we're not really this engine isn't as powerful as I thought it's not as efficient as I thought and literally we make it with yeah there we go so that's 17,000 meters above Kerbin and we literally have zero fuel we ran out of fuel completely um, and you can see here that I, could, I thought there was something playing up with the physics because the craft fell over a couple of times when it shouldn't have and it's just wobbling here for no reason I mean SAS is turned on but why would it be moving because of that it's really really strange I did reset some of the goo canisters and transmit some data but I cut that all out because it was while I was trying to fix the um, well it happened yeah within short periods of time of when the craft you know things bugged out basically and I don't know what was causing that whether it could be a mod conflict or something it wasn't too big a deal but it was kind of frustrating to try and do and then I got this stuck in the chase camera and that annoyed me as well <laughs> so yeah I ended up taking oh yeah and that thing st decided to spin around throwing me off this is seriously this this is the kind of thing that was happening for quite a lot of the mission so something wasn't quite right, right with the physics here but I'll, I managed to deal with it okay so there we go, just checking that we have all the science that we have. There were seven bits of science there. And we uh, time warp, there we go. And we're going to get back, hopefully fairly safely. We've got our heat shield on, everything's um, set up, you know, it should be absolutely fine. So the mission was actually um, a success in the end, although it did have its problems. <laughs> the rocket fell over and I had, and yeah, it was, it was kind of stupid, to be honest, of me to not have any solar panels or anything on there permanently and it was also kind of stupid that I tried to open the communications thing before we actually landed but that's one of the problems that comes along with using the LV-909 because it doesn't actually generate any power and the craft was spinning around violently here as well it was a bit strange but uh, yeah the, the LV-909 doesn't actually generate electricity which is one of the downsides of it one of the things that makes it a lot uh, more difficult to use and again here you can see why is the craft pointing in that direction something's not quite right but anyway we bring it down safely recover the vessel and that's uh, 499 signs from that mission so you can see there that's all the stuff 
And now we get to unlock a couple more things. So there we go. Um, we decide we need these antennae, which can go a lot further. 60 gigameters, I think it is. Oh no, we actually go for this one in the end because it can fold away a bit better for things. But it's only 40 gigameters or something. I presume that's what it means. Uh, GM. So that's that's the one we end up going for in the end. Was just having a look at the other uh, alternatives. But yeah, that's that's going to allow us to go a lot further. 40 gigameters is a long, long way. Just trying to think of how many zeros that is. Anyway, <laughs> megameters, so kilometers, megameters, gigameters. So yeah, several million kilometers, I think. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so there we go. We decide to order, um, or order, I don't even know, um, research that particular node in the tech tree. Then we have 263 science left so we can get a couple of other things. I decided to go for the um, the parts in this section I think, the specialized construction um, because those give us uh, docking ports and then I also go for this one just because it's the only thing we can afford and it, you know that means that was like the furthest one back in the tech tree so we want to kind of unlock it reasonably evenly. Anyway thanks for watching guys I hope you like the video and as always have a nice day.